starting recording. So I told you I figured we would end up not needing the whole time to, for lecture one, so let's just dive into the next one. So this is trying to do two things at the same time. It is introducing you to your very first set of general linear models with either no predictors or one predictor. But along the way, we're going to review all the stuff that you hopefully would have seen as prerequisite knowledge for this course. The idea of estimates, standard errors, sampling distributions, null hypotheses, type 1 errors, type 2 errors, power, those words ringing bells a little bit. If you're like, no, then this may feel a little fast, but I'm trying to get us all on the same page so that we can get to the new stuff. So this is kind of a review unit, but it may not be depending on how you are, where you came from in terms of your background and how recently this stuff is. So, all right, making sure I'm still recording. All right, Zoomers, are you still with me? They're, they've been awfully quiet for a while. Okay, excellent, just making sure. If I ever get uh, my microphone having problems or other connection issues, please tell me. I'm keeping the chat open, and Erica's in the chat. Are you in the chat, Sue Sam? No, today. Okay, Erica's in there. You can talk to her, too. Um, all right, away we go. So, steps in quantitative data analysis. Bigger picture stuff here. The process of applying statistical models to a sample of data to answer your research questions. First step, get data. <laughs> Enter data, download it from somewhere, or otherwise acquire it. That's step one. Importing it into your software of choice. So it may start out in some other format, like a text file or an Excel file, and it needs to become an R file or a Stata file or a SAS file, what have you. And verify that it was imported accurately. So one of the ways to do this is to generate univariate descriptive statistics. If you know that you have a item where there's only five choices, and you see that that item has a max of nine, and it should have a max of five, you know somewhere there's a typo. Another one to watch for is missing data codes. Some people will fill in numbers for quantitative or categorical variables when they mean it's missing. That's an older convention that I would recommend not doing anymore. But if you have missing data codes, you will have to take them back out or otherwise tell your software that that's what they mean. A common missing data code is negative 99. That's like that some combination of a negative and then a series of nines, because that is a value that is very unlikely to be found in practice. Now, if you forget this step and you see on your distribution, you, I have a minimum of minus 99 and a, and a max of five, it's like, oh, I know what happened. Now, if I compute a mean without fixing that, does that number mean anything? <laughs> no, minus 99 is not a number, but the software will treat it as such. So this, like every example I'm going to show you, step one is print the descriptives and make sure that the values are in the ranges they're supposed to be. Then figure out what kind of model you need. And this is an iterative process. So we would estimate a model, check the results for potential problems, potentially estimate more models, check those results, and keep going until we have a series of things that we think tell the story and answer the question that we're interested in. And by the way, the way that I talk in this class is not the way that I write. So like you're getting, you know, off the cuff, Lisa, like professional Lisa is quite different. Like I'll say we're gonna run this model or we're gonna fit this model, but we don't say that in formal writing. So instead of saying that you ran an analysis or calculated something, you would say that you conducted an analysis or you estimated something. Those are the, the right words. So more notation. In describing variables, people will use a lot of different synonyms to mean the same thing. In the models I'm going to show you, one variable is going to be something that is predicted and other variables are going to be doing the predicting. What people call that varies across discipline though. So in thinking about this, if a variable that is a reason why an outcome is the way it is, is always gonna be an X in my notation. What is being explained by that variable is always gonna be a Y. Textbooks are inconsistent about that, but I always try to keep it the same. So if you see an X, know that that is the explainer. The Y is the thing to be explained. Terms that you will hear that are synonymous, exogenous is a synonym for an X variable, endogenous is a Y variable. Those terms come out of something called path analysis where we represent a model graphically with boxes and arrows. 
and the thing that is being predicted has an arrow going into it. So that's how I remember endogenous arrow goes in. Exogenous is that it's the X variable instead. So those are my mnemonics. My preferred terms for this that you will hear across the semester is that X is a predictor and Y is an outcome. They're generic, they work for every situation, and that's what I'm going to say. If you take design of experiments or any other kind of class that has more of an ANOVA focus, then you may hear terms like independent variable versus dependent variable. Those terms sound familiar? Yeah. So IV and DV for short. Dependent variable is used more often in these experimental kinds of designs. IV is usually referring to a variable that is manipulated, like randomly assigning people to group, then group is your IV. If you have a variable that is measured, you're not fixing it, you're just collecting it, some folks would call that a covariate. And other folks use covariate for a very specific kind of predictor, meaning one that someone else cares about who is not you. So you will hear this distinction made on a theoretical basis. I have these predictors and then I have these covariates. Every field has something that they feel like they have to put in their model or they won't believe the rest of the results. So when I was uh, more on the cognitive side of things, I did research in cognitive aging. And in that literature, you had to control for biological age first in your model before you could talk about anything else. Because whatever else you add had to add information to the prediction beyond just how old they were. In, I've also worked a lot in studies of children's language and controlling for mother's education is required. They will not listen to your conclusions if you don't have that variable in there. And I once asked like, well, what about fathers? What about grandmas? What about grandpas? Why is it the mom's fault if my kid can't talk? I don't know, that's a question for a different class. Can you think of any variables like that from your worlds where you have to have this as part of your story or no one's gonna listen to you? Socioeconomic status often functions that way. Certain disciplines, I'm thinking of the social sciences. I know there's folks from the other sciences here too. Yeah, so covariate is a word that people sometimes use for measured predictor. They sometimes mean it, a thing I don't care about but have to put in the model anyway. And then if you took another type of regression class, you would hear the word criterion for the why that is to be predicted. So outcome, why, criterion, endogenous variable, those are all synonyms. Predictor, X, IV, and covariate, you can think of those as all synonyms together too. So let's practice. Here's a couple of research questions that I made up. I'd like you to answer two questions about each variable in the sentence. Is it a predictor or an outcome? And then based on the wording, can you tell what kind of variable it is? Is it categorical or quantitative? And Zoomers, you can play too. I'm watching the chat or you can talk. So to what extent does positive feedback improve performance, speed, and accuracy more than neutral feedback? What's my predictor in that sentence? Positive feedback. Versus? Yeah, positive versus neutral. So that is what kind of variable? Categorical, Categorical more specifically, because it's two kinds. Binary, yes. Very good. Uh, what about an outcome? I got two outcomes. If you want to predict them in the same model, that's the next class too. We're going to do one at a time in this class. That would require a multivariate model, meaning more than one outcome at the same time. Particularly if you wanted to look at speed accuracy trade-offs, right? Because you can't usually improve both at the same time. Speed and accuracy, are those numbers or kinds? It could be kinds if you cut them up. If you measured it like in response time continuously though, numbers. then that's definitely a number. Accuracy is a number. Is it continuous? Eh, what's the lowest you can be? Yeah, it's bounded. So it's bounded between 0 and 1 for proportion or 0 and 100 for percentage. So that's an example of a variable that would be better predicted by a model that understands boundaries. That's the next class, too. So the take-home point of this entire slide is basically like, go to the next class, too. But we're, we're building the building blocks to get there, though. So if you had response speed is something we could probably predict as a continuous outcome and not worry about the boundaries, as long as it's far enough away from 0. 
Here's one that's a little tricky. How is faster academic growth in elementary school related to more fre frequent reading to children when they were in preschool? So I ordered this one backwards. What's my predictor? How frequently you read to your child when they were in preschool. Now that could be a scale score, that could be a number of hours, that could be a five point, never, a lot, sometimes, etc. Could be any of those. We don't know from the wording. What's the outcome? Academic growth. Oh, but that, in order to show growth, what do you need to do? You gotta have a baseline. So there's an implicit predictor in this of time. Where, where were you, where was your academic, whatever, right? There's no noun after that. Academic whatever before at your baseline, what is it now? In order to show growth, you need to have time as part of a predictor. That's the class I teach at 1230. That's the longitudinal class. You wanna get time. And then how effective is teacher training for creating higher rates of positive feedback to a teacher's students? What's my predictor? Teacher training, do we have any sense as to what that would look like? Nope, not from this wording. So these are research questions that would require a lot more information in terms of being able to predict what the model would look like. You have to know how these things are measured. So whenever I have consulting types of questions for folks, like when they come to me, that's usually my first question is, what kind of variable is this? Is this a number or a kind? And then within the subkinds, we get into that because that dictates how I would think about putting it in an analysis. Teacher training of some kind for creating higher rates of positive feedback to the teacher's student. What's the outcome? Yeah, positive, positive feedback. feedback. Yeah, the amount of feedback. But who is the outcome measured for? The students. And the predictor is measured for their teacher. Is that a problem? Uh huh. So with respect to the students in a classroom, if they all have the same teacher and that teacher undergoes the same training because it's the same person, is that a variable? Nope, that's constant. So this is an example of a multi-level sampling design. That's my class next fall, I think, clustered multi-level models. That is the idea where we would have student level information, potentially predictors and outcomes, at the same time that we have teacher level information about predictors and outcomes. So you can think of it as like a modeling lasagna, like there's layers to it. And in order to answer a question like that, you would have to have that kind of layered approach because you'd have to collect from multiple teachers and multiple students. So good job with the predictors versus outcomes though. That was the point of the story. So what makes one of these variables a predictor and what makes one of them the outcome? It's the way the question's worded. Like you could, it, it, yeah, I mean, it is somewhat arbitrary, but the wording of the question and usually the logic in terms of how the variables are measured drives the direction of which is the predictor and which is the outcome. Particularly for things like training or feedback, like you're doing this on purpose to see what happens. The training is the X, the what happens is the Y. All right, in terms of language, we're gonna talk a lot about how X and Y relate in this class, but we're not gonna talk about it in terms of causal language. So causal inference, as I was taught back in my original uh, methods courses as an undergraduate and graduate student, requires three things. If I wanna say that X causes Y, I have to have X come first. I have to say that X was under complete control and random assignment, like I caused X. That's the standard. And then the design of the study would have to eliminate all the other reasons why X and Y are related. So this is where you get into sort of the classic, like ice cream sales spike when murder rates, murder rates spike. It's like, no, they're not causing each other. They're just things that happen when we're hot. <laughs> like, it's just a, co a coincidence. There's a lot of funny memes on the internet about lack of causation and stuff. There's one of my favorites is there's like this roof like a tin roof that's really, really dented on one part and there's a cat sitting in it. It was like, no, this is not causation. Like the cat did not dent the roof. The cat found the roof and thought, this is a great place to sit. So 
we're not going to have this in most real world research. Now, some of you from the harder sciences where you have control over things, like you might actually have the chance to show causal attributions. But those of us working with real people and real kids in the real world, like, no, like it's, it's very difficult. So we're going to use words like relate, associate, correlate, this kind of language that is a little bit softer in terms of saying why things happen. So even though I'm thinking of this in a uh, X causes Y from a modeling standpoint, like X is my predictor and Y is my outcome, I have to make room in my head for the fact that it could have gone the other way. We don't know. If you collect both of these things at the same time and they're both measured variables, there's really no way that we can know. And this has nothing to do with the kind of analysis that you do. So it can be tricky to think about this like, well, if I have a correlation, that's automatically just associative, right? No, you can have a correlation between two variables and have a causal inference, and you can have other things and not have the causal inference. So we're going to use associative language to be on the safe side. Try not to say cause unless you truly mean it. Um, one of the other classes I teach is called structural equation modeling. Some people call that causal modeling. It is not causal. It's a decomposition of a correlation matrix. That's what it is. All right. 310. I think this is a good stopping point. How about that? Yeah, don't want to overrun the time, especially on the second week of classes. I'm trying to get you to come back. Yeah. So questions or comments as we wrap up for our Tuesday? No. All right. Well, I'll be here for a few minutes after class. If you do have any, thanks for being here, Zoomers and Rumors. Hope to see you again Thursday. I will let you know when your first formative assessment is available soon. All right. Peace out. There's another expression for you. <laughs> Um, I do have a question. 